Oh, well, we have a lot of people anyway. I think so. I, it's an echo here. All right, we'll get started. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. This is the panel on the future of marine technology and ocean engineering. Back, I don't know, a couple of years ago when I came in to invite Rick Spinrad to be the honorary chairman, we talked about what we would like to see at this meeting, and this is one that came up. And so here we are following through on that discussion. Um, and we noted that and I think Rick noted this in his talk, that um, there were oceans conferences in D.C. in the mid-90s and the mid-2000s, and it would be interesting to envision what we would be looking at in those conferences and what those conferences would be looking like. And so that's what we're here today to talk about. Um, I'm going to introduce the panel briefly. We have a lot of people. I try not to spend much time. And then Rick's going to take over as moderator. And Hopefully, we're going to have a lot of audience interaction. I want people's opinions and, and viewpoints. So. Um, so we have as moderator Rick Spinred, chief scientist from NOAA, um, over here in the panel. And maybe you'll raise your hand, because I'm not doing this in the order that you are. We've got um, Ken Grembowitz from the Naval Oceanographic Office and Kent Satterley from Shell Oil. So I would say probably safely that that defense and oil and gas constitutes the vast majority of um, at least consumption of marine technology and ocean engineering uh, products and drives a lot of the innovation. So we've got them here. Um, we have Victor Zykov from the Schmidt Ocean Institute. Um, and we've got Susan Avery from the very, very recently emeritus <laughs> president of, of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, and I was thinking about this, that, you know, that Schmidt Ocean Institute is, you know, this sort of looking at the private foundation and, and private um, support driving ocean technology. And it's, it's not a new thing. There's an Embari example. But then I went back and thought about, um, for Susan, you know, the Columbus Islin and Woods Hole uh, oceanographic in 1930 or whatever. So, so it's a very similar one, one, model. Two. It's not. It's not new, but it's been important to our, to our, uh, our interests. Um, we also have uh, Paul Holthus of uh, the World Ocean Council, CEO of World Ocean Council, who is working with, you know, I would call big business um, to uh, work on ocean sustainability. And maybe at the other end of the spectrum, um, Eric Stackpole, who is a co-founder of Open ROV. And Open ROV, is, if you don't know about them, is a really interesting uh, group that's used the power of uh, crowdfunding, open source development, and um, sort of maker philosophy to develop a, a low-cost, capable um, contribution to ocean exploration. And then finally, we have the, the, um, the section or the um, society presidents. We've got um, Rene Guerrello and Ray Toll, who are here. Um, because, as I said, part of this is not just the future of engineering and technology, but how the societies will support that in the future. So, so keep that in mind. And I think with that, I'll turn it over to Rick. Thanks. Thank you, Doug. I can't remember the last time that I moderated a panel where the panel was larger than the audience. Uh, and and uh, in the interest of keeping this uh, uh, active dialogue, I, I'd point out, we got a lot of folks standing in the back. Please don't be bashful. There's a number of seats up here. Please feel free to come on in, especially as I'm making some opening comments since nobody's going to listen anyway. Please, please just shuffle on in, take a seat. Uh, nobody will, will bite, hopefully, yet. Um, and I thought I'd uh, start off by, uh, my intent is just to make some brief opening comments. Uh, I'll also uh, probably 
submit some of my thoughts on the future as well and abuse my privilege as the moderator uh, after we hear from our panelists here. The, if you've looked this uh, panel discussion, this uh, particular session, at one point in one version of the program was called Oceans 35, it's called Oceans 25 now. And, and my view is, this is a little bit like climate modeling. I work with a lot of climate modelers. They have the best job in the environmental sciences because they're not going to be around if they're wrong. <laughs> and, and so I'm going to leave it to the panelists to think about whether you want to focus on 25 or 35, recognizing for 35, a larger percentage of us will not be here for Oceans 35. But, but really open up the box. Think about where we're going. Envision the future. This is an opportunity to really start being provocative. Nobody's going to hold you accountable. Uh, the panel here is extremely diverse, as you heard from uh, Doug's uh, introduction from experience, from focus on science, focus on technology, policy background, industry background, government background, NGO background. So we have a real good opportunity here to get a variety of perspectives. With that, what we're going to do is give the panelists a few minutes, I would say, because it is such a large panel. Uh, we have until 5.15 for this panel, uh, discussion for this workshop, town hall session. Um, if you each take 10 minutes, we're not going to get through this. So we're all adults. Let's try to take about three to five minutes, and then we'll get into a really active dialogue here. And I will do my best to moderate among uh, eight panelists and myself. And I tried to think of a really creative, a really logical way to ask the panelists to speak. I, I'm not fond of simply saying, well, let's just go down the row. And, and I also like to try to keep the panelists a little bit on their toes. So I put great thought into this and, and looked into the uh, strategic alignment of the sectors and the experiences. Uh, I did extensive interviews with all of the panelists, uh, have all of their background information, and decided we would go alphabetically by first name. Because <laughs> no matter how you slice this, uh, it's going to be a very different perspective for each one. So if I did my alphabet right, we're going to start with Eric. And I'd ask again that you take th three to five minutes for your opening comments. And what we will do is we'll go through the panelists here, give them all a chance to speak, and then we'll open it up for discussion. So Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rick. Um, so my name is Eric Stackpole. I'm a co-founder of Open ROV. We make really low-cost uh, robotic submarines, and our goal is pretty simple. We want to change the way that exploration is done. We want to democratize ocean exploration. So um, our story started with a lost treasure in the bottom of a cave. Um, there's a story that in the 1800s there was a gold robbery, and these bandits ran away with an estimated 100 pounds of gold, threw it in the bottom of an underwater cave way up in the mountains of the Trinity Alps in California, and no one had been able to get to the bottom of the pit since. So um, that kind of as a hobby kicked off building this little ROV out of maker parts using laser cutters and things like that um, to go try to find the gold, because God knows my mother wouldn't let me go there myself. Um, so we did this. I met my co-founder, David Lang. Um, people started hearing about this story. Um, the New York Times picked it up. Um, we wanted to explore this with tools that we built ourselves. And we realized that we have one story, but there are tons of people around the world who have their own stories. Um, curiosity is why we're doing all of this. It's the reason we pursue science. We're all innately curious. So we launched a kit where people could build the same thing that we had come up with on Kickstarter, a crowdfunding webpage. Um, we reached our goal in two and a half hours, and it kept on growing. And now we're a business. Um, I, I guess technically we're the largest volume ROV manufacturer in the world. We've shipped 1,600 ROV kits around the world to date. And we just launched another ROV that's going to be ready to go called Trident. It's on Kickstarter now, and um, we reached that goal in three minutes. Um, so what we're trying to do is put these tools in the hands of everyday people at an affordable price and connect them all together so that we can share what we're exploring. And that's what we're all about. Great. So real quickly, uh, Ocean's 35, what's going to be different for, from your perspective? Well, we'll probably all be teleconferencing it. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I, think that, I think that the future has a lot to do with the way that we're able to um, disseminate the findings that we have. Who is exploring is going to be different. I think crowdsource exploration has tremendous potential. Telerobotics has huge potential. 
Um, and I think the way that we share is going to be different. It's not just going to be publications and journals. It's going to be a lot of, um, it's going to be a lot more like YouTube or Wikipedia. Great. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Why don't you just pass the mic directly to your left and we'll give Ken the next uh, opportunity. All right. Thanks, Rick. Um, first, on behalf of my commanding officer from the Naval Oceanographic Office, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Naval Oceanographic Office, we're the Navy's production center for operational oceanographic, oceanographic products and services. Uh, we're located down at Stennis Space Center about an hour east of New Orleans. We operate a fleet of five military survey ships, and we have about 750 civilian personnel on staff. We also have the Navy's only continuously operating UUV operations center located there. Um, we operate 24-7. We operate gliders, sea gliders, slocum gliders, and wave gliders with a staff of 12 pilots who work 24-7 rotating shifts. They're responsible for things like command and control of these vehicles, the data processing and validation, uh, as well as they staff a call center for fleet operations or anyone that may have picked up one of our lost or wayward gliders that are out there. <laughs> In the future, we, are, uh, we hope to expand that capability outside Department of the Navy and work with other government agencies. Um, let's see. Also, we, um, we hope to bring all of the unmanned systems observations that are collected within government, industry, and academia into our oceanographic databases and numerical models. Yesterday at the plenary session, the Admiral, Admiral Gallaudet mentioned his unmanned systems strategy. I'd like to leave you with the three goals of that strategy. And the first is to expand the use of unmanned systems within naval oceanography. And the way we plan on doing that is over the next two to three years, uh, expand the, primarily our glider operations from 10 to 30 vehicles that we have right now in the water continually operating on missions from 90 to 120 days. We hope to expand that to around 60 vehicles in the water at any given time. Um, second is to enable fleet and joint forces use of unmanned systems through the use or through leveraging our subject matter experts, our operations center, and, um, and our programs of record. For, for acquisition. And then lastly is to engage stakeholders in future technology development. We want to make sure that any technology that's transitioned from research into operations meets the needs and requirements of naval oceanography whenever possible. Thank Great. Thank you, Ken. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a stickler about this, and I really appreciate the, the describing what your perspectives are now, but I'm also going to ask you, Ken, say, so your successor or your successor's successor who comes here from Nav Oceano and Oceans 25 or 35 for that matter, what do you think is going to be different in what they present to a group like this from what you just presented? Well, I, th I think not only changes or improvements in sensor performance and, and system dynamics, but I think what we're going to see is collection of more and more data that's going to lead to uh, improvements in our forecasting capabilities because one of the biggest challenges to operating EUVs is the environment itself. And having a very reliable, predictive system um, enables you to overcome a lot of those challenges. And I think as we start to couple models uh, in terms of looking forward towards ESPC and things like the Earth System Prediction Capability, I think that's the things that we'll be talking about 10 years from now. Great. OK, thank you. Let's, and let's move down to the end of the line. And Kent, from an industry perspective, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. My name is Kent Satterley with Shell Offshore Incorporated. Let me tell you a little bit about my company. Shell is a global energy company that operates in more than 70 countries around the world. We depend heavily on new technology and innovation to explore for and produce oil and natural gas in ever more challenging situations and places. We have businesses in renewable energy, including wind and biofuel, and we refine and supply a wide range of energy products, including fuels and lubricants. I'm glad to be here today representing Shell's offshore deep water business in the Americas. Over the last 30 years, we have achieved exceptional technological milestones in the design, construction, installation, and operation of deep water production assets. So where is deep water headed? The offshore industry is exploring and producing in water depths approaching 10,000 feet, enabled by technological advancements and sophistication, and most importantly, we can do it safely. We have demonstrated this by surpassing many technology, technological milestones. For example, our Perdido development in the Gulf of Mexico is in 8,000 feet of water, or, if you will, six Empire State buildings stacked one on top of the other. 
and close to about 50% of our production in the Gulf of Mexico is from subsea developments where the, where the wellhead is on the sea floor. Our Perdido development was the first, uh, the first commercial production from the lower tertiary reservoir in the Gulf of Mexico, and it was the first facility anywhere to employ subsea separation of, of uh, gas and oil and, and then to pressure boost that up to the surface. So we had uh, downhole pump, we had uh, pumps that sat on the seafloor. Our priorities at Shell, in, in the last 25 years, Shell has invested in more than 100 marine life, coastal, and offshore research and technology projects. And recently, also including the Atlantic, to address conservation, restoration, and habitat-related opportunities. One example is the effect of seismic and sound on marine mammals. Shell and other companies are collaborating together on two joint industry programs to conduct research and look at new technologies for mitigating the effects. Baseline and long-term environmental monitoring data are critical to understanding the interrelated and interconnected ecosystems. We all need good data to better understand impacts on the environment and identify ways to mitigate these impacts. We're using data collected from different types of ocean technologies to show communities how ocean users, including fishing, tourism, military, government research, and oil and gas are interconnected through state-of-the-art 3D visualization and interactive maps with ArcGIS technology. The assimilation of data and leveraging of technology is changing the way we think about the ocean and helping to educate communities on how we can coexist in a productive and a protect, uh, protective manner. Shell wants to play a role in a public-private partnership or collaboration that can leverage funding, expertise, existing infra infrastructure to collect baseline data and measure changes in the ocean environment that will enable good decision-making and policy outcomes. Let me provide a few recent examples where we have already done this. We've participated in the scientific and environmental ROV partnership using existing technology or the SERPENT program in the Gulf of Mexico. Scientists work with industry ROVs from drilling rigs to collect information to identify and classify deep sea organ organisms that can fill critical biological knowledge gaps and improve e ecosystem models. Shell and NOAA, along with academic, military, and NGO partners, are working together to operate autonomous ocean vehicles or gliders and instruments on our platforms in the Gulf to collect near real-time data to improve hurricane forecasting and prediction models and also aid in the monitoring of loop currents and its variability, which is of critical importance to ensuring safe operations and the protection of people, assets, and the environment. Furthermore, we are expanding glider sensor capabilities to also monitor the ecosystem, including monitoring of fish with acoustic tags. In our technology-driven world, it is easy for many to take energy for granted. Everything we do each moment requires energy. As the world population grows and living standards continue to rise, we need to develop multiple energy resources, including oil and gas and renewables. While we see progress in the development of renewable sources of energy, oil and gas will continue to be needed. In closing, there, there are we are, we're in exciting and challenging times, and the growth in offshore oil and natural gas brings tremendous opportunities for domestic energy jobs and economic development and ocean technology. With budget cuts in the private sector due to low oil prices and budget reductions in government institutions, the leveraging of resources in, and infrastructure has become ever more important. Success means that we achieve a healthy marine environment and a productive economy. And while doing so, I believe we can equip communities with the means to understand how offshore energy and oil and gas will affect them and how it can benefit them as well. We look forward to partnering with XPRIZE and others in optimizing our respective skills and resources to advance our understanding of the ocean. We hope that our efforts will serve as a valuable model for others. Thank you. Thank you, Kent. And, and I think the, uh, it's fair to say over the uh, decades of history of the Oceans Conferences, I, Triple OES, and MTS have enjoyed a really good active dialogue with the oil and gas industry. Ten years from now, same question. How do you see that changing in terms of uh, the formation and formulation of the Oceans Conference? Well, I think we'll still be using oil and gas by then. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think more of it will be in the deeper waters. 
uh, it will be even deeper than it is today. So um, the advances that we made in deep water, underwater technology are going to have to continue to progress if we're going to if we're going to find and produce that oil and gas. So still a robust portfolio of techno marine technology issues sure. that will be on the on Absolutely. the roster. Yep. Yes. Good. Thank you. Uh, Paul Holthus with the World Ocean Council. What's your perspective on this? Great. Thanks. <coughs> thanks, Rick, and thanks uh, for the uh, invitation, the opportunity to be here. Um, so I'm really impressed with your fundraising uh, record. I, I, was, I was impressed with the two and a half hours and wish I had been able to accomplish something in that, and then you said three minutes for the second round. So. <laughs> uh, that's, that's pretty impressive. So I, what I would see, uh, so World Ocean Council is a global multi-industry uh, <clears throat> leadership alliance bringing together a whole range of ocean industries to collaborate on ocean science and stewardship and uh, sustainability. So let me jump right to the, your, your question at the end, Rick. Uh, <clears throat> 35 years from now, um, I think this discussion and, and these kind of meetings will have a whole lot of industry people like Kent in the room because uh, if we can deliver on what we're trying to make happen and, and build on what's already been happening uh, for a number of years uh, around the world, we will have a lot of ocean users, ocean industries in the room talking about the data that they are collecting and sharing and providing. And so our, part of our uh, vision and, and role is, is harnessing that potential and, and making, that, uh, making that possible. So 35 years from now, uh, well, I mean, to, to look at the baseline, right now we've got 50 to 80,000 merchant vessels out there. And what percentage of those are, are regularly collecting uh, data that's, that's feeding into the public databases that we all need to better manage our ocean? Uh, 1.3 million fishing boats is a rough estimate. Uh, there's a million kilometers of submarine cable. Uh, we've got, uh, as you know, growing numbers of wind farms. We've got, uh, of course, then, uh, thousands of, of oil rigs and oil exploration and production uh, vessels and facilities. Uh, and of course, coming uh, uh, in the near future, seabed mining operations. So all of these and other <coughs> industry operations uh, have the potential, and we're working to harness that potential to be uh, collecting data by hosting and deploying instruments, uh, as, as uh, many companies have been doing off and on over the years. So we want to build on that experience. And, and really make this a more systematic and um, sort of proactive and strategic approach to using these industry uh, facilities and, and resources to help us understand not only the ocean, but also building on the many, uh, the many, many decades of experience of, of industry, particularly the shipping industry, and providing meteorological data. So there's a good experience and track record and partnership there and also expanding into uh, climate quality data, which of course is a whole other level of, uh, of uh, quality assurance and control needed for the data to feed into climate modeling. Uh, and I, I would just uh, uh, maybe close by saying that I think uh, this is not only, it, it's got its value that, uh, uh, that you can see immediately in terms of increasing the flow, the, the amount, and hopefully the quality uh, of data that's coming from many parts of the world where we need that data. Uh, but also that because these industries are, as, as Ken was saying, uh, many of them are users of that data. We need the outputs, the, uh, the visualization, the delivery of products and services using that data. This is really a virtuous cycle of, of harnessing the role of industry to be collecting and, and sharing data, but also then driving uh, the user community, uh, those of you in the technology sector that provide the, the products and the services, and I think that's basically says uh, marketplace to it. So if we can be harnessing even a small percentage of those many thousand vessels and rigs and wind farms to be needing the instrumentation and using the instrumentation, that creates a marketplace for those of you that, that build, the, uh, build the instruments, the software, the visualization tools, et cetera. And I think that's a big part of the future is that, is that partnership becoming much bigger as all these industries uh, grow. So thanks, Rick. So thank you, Paul. Uh, following up on this concept of uh, an expanded industry component to OCEANS conferences in the future, will it be the same logos we see now, just bigger, or are there going to be some new logos there, in, in figuratively of, speaking? Well, well here's uh, completely pandering to the audience. The MTS logo will be the biggest one. Yeah. <laughs> and the OES logo. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the OES, sorry. Yeah. 
uh, but who knows? It's a you know it's a constantly evolving uh, evolving landscape. But you understand my question. I mean, are, are there emerging companies? No, that, I know what you, that's yeah. what I mean. It's, okay. a, it's a constantly evolving landscape, and who knows? Particularly with the uh, the real deep deep uh, ocean work that's going on, and with the the uh, the emergence of the uh, the seabed mining industry, who knows? We may have some significant new um, companies to be engaging with. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to shift all the way to the left geographically, not politically, and, and I'm going to ask uh, my friend Ray Toll, president, the, in, the enviable position of being president of the Marine T Technology Society uh, for his perspectives. <laughs> Funny you should say that on a day like today, right? <laughs> well, thank you, Rick, and I, I really, this is a very, uh, this is great to have this kind of event because uh, I, I am all ears to hear all these opinions. In fact, half of you in the room will be with me tomorrow afternoon for our hot wash. How about a raise of hands of all the board members from JOAB and MTS and IEEE. You'll see a whole bunch of us. Uh, we're all in this together. I, I, would, I would offer this to you. Uh, MTS has three conferences a year in the United States and one overseas because the OCEAN's model there's always one in North America, and there's always one overseas. This past May was Genoa, Italy. Next May will be in Shanghai. We also have the Offshore Technology Conference in Houston the first week of May, an underwater intervention in New Orleans. It's either in February or early March, or maybe late January. Anyway, this is how our 3,600 members and a whole list of technology-based companies participate in the society. And inside the society, there are these committees and in, the, in our grouping of geographical sections. We made a commitment a couple of years ago, be, mainly because of our, our partnership with the Ocean Engineering Society, to go more international. We thought that the base of this technology could be more international. We might be able to do more things with GEOS, the Global Earth Observing System of Systems, how the Global Ocean Observing System interconnects. So I, I have a vision. Inside the societies, we have the academic world, we have the private sector world, we have the public sector world. And in my, my brain, as I look forward to 2025 and 2035, I'd like to see the continuation of our thoughts of these societies using these conferences as incubators of and fostering more cooperation. I like the I words, innovation, incubation, leading to integration. What does integration mean? It means bringing the physical sciences together with the social sciences where we can, where, where I think the technology will improve enough to be able to allow us to do that. So what would that mean for an oceans conference? It would mean our view or our goal is this will become the worldwide go-to conference across the dome, across the globe. I mean, why not? Uh, we, we could, we, I think potentially we have that opportunity. In the MTS world, we have these conferences I've already mentioned, and I would like to leverage more and more uh, the lessons learned and what each of those bring because they cover all of these different pieces and parts of our society already. Why not figure out ways to grow them together as a collective menu because, you know, I, I always feel that uh, if when people get together and start talking, exchanging ideas, that's what, uh, that's what Oceans really is all about. If we, if, if, if going forward we can start, we, one of the things we do in MTS is we we have tech surges. Tech surges are a subset of a conference, and it's, it's meant to bring in the technologies we all use today, but also looking at what I would call our non-prototype marine technologies. What about the biopharmaceutical world? What about uh, other, other places you know, that I can't even think of that are measuring something in the water? And maybe it's upstream in riverbeds, maybe it's the Great Lakes, but so if, if the idea of go, the go-to conference can be achieved in 2025, I'll be a happy camper. So let's tease that out a little bit. And what do you think, if you looked at the program for Oceans 2025, what will be different? What will we have in there that we don't currently have? And maybe pursuing the next layer of the discussion with regard to some of these sectors. My dream is you'll have the United States Navy, uh, NOAA, Shell, combined presentation. You will see, you know, this idea of a, a public, private-public partnership, a private-public partnership 
coming together in a meaningful way in 2025, where you're actually starting to see a, a new uh, way of thinking about how do we operate together in a more efficient, effective manner. And you start to blur the line between government and private sector and academia. Great. Thank you, Ray. Let's move right over to Renee and the same question, and I had preface it by saying that as a participant uh, and then for a short period of time a, a, a leader in the society myself, the relationship, the MTS-OES relationship has really evolved very nicely, and I think we're, we're all benefiting from that. So where do you see it going from the OES perspective? Yeah, thank you, and probably because I'm <coughs> the only international here uh, that is non-American. Because overseas for you is overseas, not overseas for me. Uh, so uh, the, the topic, the main topic of this, uh, this panel is uh, the future of oceans conferences, not the future of ocean research or so. But, so f to look into the future and see what, uh, what it could be for the oceans conferences, we have to look into the past to see where we are coming from. And uh, in the past, not so far away, not so, far, not so long away, um, even if I've been there for a long time, uh, something that struck me in, in uh, the 10 years ago, in 2005, was that the previous conferences were having their own uh, direction, their own topics, and in terms of continuity, uh, that was not good because from one conference to the other, the, the, th the theme were different. So uh, I came up with a, with a scheme, and in order to have the same topics from one conference to the other, doesn't mean because you have a topic that you are going to get papers, because if you don't get papers, you don't have session on what you would like to have, but at least uh, the offer is there, and uh, so we, we work together, John Flory is in the room, on, in having, and, uh, and Sandy Williams, uh, in having um, something like eight or nine main topics. And in doing this exercise, we, we found out that some topics that were proposed in the past, past of 2005 at this time, were dropped because we had a topic about uh, polar exploration, for instance. No paper forever for 10 years, so we dropped it. Doesn't mean that it won't come back one day. We, we have some, uh, some possibility in the Arctic. So that's uh, having topics and recognize uh, that the, the continuity, the conference is, um, uh, is proposing something that is uh, consistent, gives a flavor. So now we have to look at the evolution of the topics. We are in 2015. We still have the same topics that we have in 2005. What will be these topics in 2025, 35, et cetera? So we have to see, we have to look at what uh, the evolution of, of, of the domain is. And that's why this is very interesting what was said. What I can pick was ocean uh, conference is not an oil and gas conference, but uh, it deals about the mineral resources which are uh, down below. I don't mean Australia, so down below is, uh, <laughs> sorry, it's mal. <laughs> uh, but energy resources as well, I mean, the ocean is providing what is on the bottom of the ocean, but also what is at the surface of the ocean, and the uh, renewable marine energy uh, possibilities come from uh, this part, and that was explained. Uh, we, uh, uh, we have also uh, the environmental concerns, I mean, uh, Ray was talking about GEOS. GEOS is part of the Global Earth Observation uh, Secretariat and, uh, and uh, let's say, uh, a consortium in a sense of state and uh, non-governmental organization. And so the climate change is, is a topic which is, uh, I think, of interest. We will have a uh, very large conference uh, in three weeks or four weeks from now in Paris with all the states in the world, almost. Uh, what is new now? And what could be new in the future, that's something that we have to look at. Uh, we, an oceans conference is not only about underwater vehicles. Underwater vehicles, if I can make a parallel with the telecommunication world, which is also something I'm working in, more and more the devices and so on are what we call the low level, and the highest level is intelligence, the world that you said yesterday, uh, of the understanding of not only the device, but what the device is providing as uh, information, so information. So, uh, Susan has not yet uh, <laughs> taken the floor, so I, I put already something about what she was going to say. But, uh, <laughs> 
But the ocean is okay, the resources, mineral resources, the energy, uh, the possibility to go down there and do things, but it's also the driver of the climate. And she has a very good and excellent, uh, fantastic presentation about ocean, atmosphere, driving the climate. And that's, we have to recognize that. An ocean conference, we must recognize that there are variables, parameters on the ocean, and we, have, we, we need to measure that. So, uh, meaning that, uh, we need, when I say that, uh, one of the panelists was talking about whatever number of boats getting measures. We have satellites, uh, and uh, yesterday you were talking about uh, petabytes. Uh, um, and this word petabytes, uh, in the general public, so far doesn't mean anything, uh, but in the near future, it's going to mean something. Megabyte, everyone knows what is megabyte. You have I have plenty of megabytes on my stuff here, yeah, 64. Uh, when I was a young Gigabytes. <laughs> Gigabytes. Gigabytes, okay. You see, I'm, I'm if you don't, I'll give you mine. You okay. <laughs> so, so gigabytes is uh, general public, except myself, of course, knows what it is. When I was a young scientist at, at NOAA, actually, uh, I was working with very interesting and uh, uh, tabletop uh, computer with uh, 64 kilobytes. Uh, <laughs> so, what I mean is that uh, data management, uh, in the future we will have, we still will actually have uh, a, a deluge, as we say in French, of data, and we are going to have uh, fentabyte, zettabyte, whatever it's, uh, but they exist, this word exists. Uh, so, how do we do manage that? So, data management, big data, is something that is going to be also of uh, very uh, large interest in oceans conferences because that's what we do. We measure things. Are, are they connected? And uh, that's the, 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 the main word you were talking about innovation, integration. I would like to add education. And uh, another I, which is international. Uh, education is an E, I know. Uh, but all these fields, all these measurements are connected. They are connected. And what is the future? 2035, 2050, the future is already here. The future is now. The future is digital. Okay? And what is digital means that uh, we have data and uh, they, they, must be, they must drive and give information. And the information uh, is by itself, you cannot by yourself, find the information like that. So the devices, they must be connected. And uh, the future, I'm afraid that it is the future, is going to uh, have the, uh, what we, uh, we call the Internet of Things. And all these objects are connected. That is, you have something, some stuff in the middle of the Atlantic or the Pacific, and you can, on your iPhone 12, that's what you said yesterday, <laughs> So that's not any more megabyte, gigabyte, that's going to have whatever uh, numbers on it. And, uh, and you drive your device uh, in the middle of the ocean, and they're all connected, and uh, this connection is global. And the world is not only connected, and integration is global. And that's what Ray was talking about, geos. It's not the only thing, but it's part of the picture. We need to think global. And the oceans uh, of the future, the oceans conferences, must bring in this kind of topic of globalization. I was wrong. So, so let me ask you, Renee, I uh, uh, really appreciate your uh, clear definition of some of the topical evolution uh, that we will see in several years. If we follow up on some of the kinds of thoughts that Eric expressed, what do you see in the form, not so much the function, if you will, but the form of Oceans 25 or 35? Okay. How will that change? Yeah. Um, the IEEE perspective is that a conference is a forum. Okay, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way where you confront, in a sense, your peers and, and you, you talk with them. So you can talk, and all my, my, what I said uh, would probably be understood as you can talk from a remote place. You have the, 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 the Skype of the future or whatever, okay, and you can have uh, virtual conferences, but that's okay for a conference. But you have been in many conferences as I've been, and the, some of the very important talks in a conference are not in a room, they are in the corridors. And that you cannot uh, change that by do, going virtual. So for me, a conference, even in the future, is face-to-face. -face. 
maybe with some uh, virtual presence or some, uh, I don't know, holographic, you know, like Star Wars <laughs> <laughs> stuff. <laughs> But uh, you cannot avoid to, uh, to really talk to the people because that's, we are human, we are not machine. Thank you. So we'll move over to Susan. And of course, uh, Woods Hole uh, has been around a lot longer than the Oceans Conferences have been. Susan, let me start by thanking you for your leadership, your term of service at Woods Hole and your leadership of the community. And, and now we want to take advantage of that leadership <laughs> and your perspective uh, having just uh, left Woods Hole and take a look at what oceans will look like from that academic and research perspective. Sure, well, th well thank you, Rick, and it's really exciting to be here um, because we're at an exciting time. We're at an exciting time and we're at a scary time. Um, in a way, we're at a time that we're facing the largest design ch challenge of the future, and that's the future of our ocean, okay? And that future is being enabled by just tremendous advances in technology of getting into the ocean and access to the ocean. Robotics, the robotics revolution, the communications aspects of controlling robotics, the navigation aspects, the sensors, particularly the development of biological sensors, the microfluidics that is allowing these biological sensors to become uh, incorporated into AUVs um, uh, seamlessly. Um, information services, the informatics that have been mentioned here before, the ability to combine data sets, to visualize them, to mine them um, in new ways, to look for system behaviors, um, the ability to have a persistent presence in the ocean um, instead of an occasional presence um, in the ocean through networks um, of all of these um, um, activities. These are all very exciting advances, and I, sh I should say also the advances just in use of, of the genomics. Um, a lot of these advances have been born in the ocean sciences themselves. A lot have been born in sciences elsewhere and being applied to the ocean sciences. A lot of these technologies clearly are emerging technology sectors. Um, that, that we see here um, present, um, and is, that it's so important to keep that in mind. But these emerging technology sectors, of course, are also enabling sectors, um, enabling us. And they're enabling the ocean sciences in a way that is generating, an ocean, it's generating ocean knowledge, um, new ocean knowledge, new discoveries, new ways. And that, in turn, is a creator of new ocean industries, the blue economy. And the blue economy is something I do not think of as just as a set of extractive industries. So if you were looking at the future in here, I would say it would not just be oil and gas. It would not just be mining and minerals. It would not just be fisheries. It would be aquaculture. It would be bioprospecting. It would be the renewables. It would be um, the drug discoveries that we're looking at, phase two trials now and anti-malarial drugs coming from um, ocean species and ocean biological functioning. Um, and so this, this new blue economy, though, has, has also got another important aspect of this because th this technology is enabling us to look at the ocean on scales of temporally and um, uh, physically, spatially, that we've not been able to do before. The mesoscale in, in ways that allows us to, to really begin to think about more carefully the types of services, um, information services, uh, forecasts, um, outlooks, uh, extending things in seasonal outlooks, not just the daily two-day weather forecast or even a weekly weather forecast. You need the ocean in that, that ocean knowledge, in order to extend our capability of looking and being able to predict and have forecasts for a lot of these technologies and for um, uh, a lot of these. So I would expect that this uh, conference would not just have the technologies present, but have the services industries, the knowledge products, the services that are going to come out of this um, in, in ways that aren't there before. And this is very critical also in terms of our national security and how national security will change um, um, in the future with, with a lot of these products. So I, I, I think that it's an exciting time, but it's this time also where we have to be cognizant of the fact that um, our, our, our ocean is under stress, pollution, uh, certainly climate change, um, uh, ex exploitation, uh, and it's the cumulative stresses um, that worry me the most. And so while we develop these new industries, it has to be done with this conscious idea of looking at the ecosystem services, valuing those ecosystem services, and finding ways to protect those for the future. Great, thank you. I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask you, just uh, to kind of get a context of the audience, how many students, formals, we're all students, how many students, formal students do we have in the audience here? 
None? No, I can't believe that. Okay. So it, uh, a few back here, but where I'm going is that this conference has taken a number of important steps with respect to representing student interests over the years in formal ways with student poster competition, it, recognizing the educational responsibilities that you represent here. Can you comment on what you think the Oceans of the Future, Oceans Conference of the Future uh, might be with regard to student involvement or uh, student help, if you will? Um, do you have a, a strong student component here? Pardon me? Is there a strong student component at this yeah. campus? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that's great because I, I think it's, uh, I, that's your future. Uh, it should be undergraduate students, it should be graduate students, it should be postdocs. Um, I would like to see, I would have liked to have seen probably in 20, uh, the 20, Ocean's 25, a student conference. Um, that's basically done ahead of this conference. Mm -hmm. A real student conference that allows you to have students to explore opportunities amongst themselves and to have, have that sort of engagement amongst themselves. Notice the um, presidents are writing that down. I want to <laughs> <laughs> Keep talking. <laughs> Keep talking. <laughs> um, I, I, I say that because um, the American Meteorological Society does this. Um, they, in fact, I was president of the AMS when we had, we put forth our first student conference. And I thought, oh my gosh, we'll be lucky to have 20 people. Um, that student conference now has about 800 students at it every year, okay? And it is one of the most dynamic parts of the meeting. Yeah. Okay, and everyone loves it. Even the old timers love it. Yeah. Okay, so, so I think that's, that's the energy and it exposes them, it gets them involved in, in the society, it gets them involved in a community and it, and it opens up their opportunities to be exploring into the industry sectors, the nonprofit sectors, the communication, the services, all of these things that you don't get necessarily in, in, in an academic setting. So Great. I think it's really cool. Thank you, appreciate that. So it, it, I, I really appreciate the fact that your parents named you the way you did because we have now juxtaposed the newest perception in the, or the newest element in our oceanographic community, Victor from Schmidt Ocean Institute, uh, with the, the uh, bastion, if you will, of the uh, oceanographic community, the uh, Woods Holes and the Scripps that have been around for many, many years. Uh, decades and and I wonder if you'd give us a perspective from that very different angle with regard to new investments in the oceanographic community. Absolutely. Well, I actually was thinking you you would be joking about the alphabetical. Order. No, 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 no. <laughs> it, I just we when we did this, I, I I hadn't really thought about this, but now uh, uh, Susan brings a perspective from, uh, if you will, the traditional. I don't mean that pejoratively, but a traditional research and educational institutional perspective. What Schmidt Ocean Institute has done, it's brought a very different kind of uh, uh, perspective to the oceanographic community. And I think there's some interesting suggestions with respect to where we're going as a result of what Schmidt Ocean Institute has been doing. Well, I do appreciate this, Rick. Indeed, this, uh, uh, this organization, uh, Schmidt Ocean Institute, it's the model of its own. It's very unique. I've not seen this model anywhere before, and I had to have all of us at Schmidt Ocean Institute to had to have really high tolerance to ambiguity as we were starting this organization. So um, it is uh, 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 structured as an oceanographic research vessel operator. Uh, truly so. We do not have uh, staff scientists. We have program staff. We have operations. We have technology uh, capabilities, technicians, and now engineering core. Um, and uh, um, the way that we uh, have been charged is also very unique. So our task is to identify opportunities for innovation. Where can we advance the pace at which ocean is, is understood? And with technologies, with uh, intelligent analysis of information, with the sharing of information. And uh, I wanted to share some of the observations that we've uh, collected over the years and uh, potentially that we think will continue to uh, play an important role going forward uh, in several areas. Well, naturally starting with uh, um, Computation. Uh, computation becomes cheap, it becomes ubiquitous, it becomes uh, mobile, and uh, we see that in uh, all sorts of uh, uh, spawning robotic systems. We see that in capabilities where you can deploy multiple robots from the ship. You can, they can collect data in multiple locations. They can be intelligent. Uh, that's another I I wanted to add to the list of I's. <coughs> intelligence, very important. Maybe even artificial intelligence, I would say. So that the vehicles will be able to collect data, not just to collect, but also interpret and process it in order to adapt 
their missions to the tasks that they have at hand to make, make lower level, mid-level uh, decisions. They'll be able to provide higher spatial temporal coverage, reduce the costs of data acquisition, operate in areas that are uh, too rough or too remote or too shallow for other uh, systems. And that's actually a follow-up on the Renee's note about uh, the uh, vehicle you can control on the iPhone 12. Uh, actually, you can do it on iPhone 5 and iPhone 4, and the vehicle is called Sail Drill, and it's operating uh, successfully in the uh, uh, in the waters of uh, uh, Gulf of Alaska and the Gulf of Mexico as well. So there's technologies are occurring uh, now. Uh, because we're a ship operator tasked with bringing scientists on board of the ship and providing them with the best and the newest technologies, we're also observing changes in the way that the ships are operated. It's interesting, this is an oceanographic conference, but we're, there's so little discussion about the ships, right? Because the ship's roles are changing, becomes invisible, and this is how it should be. The ships become supporters of technology trials, uh, uh, testing, advancement. They become the hubs of information acquisition. They be become the hubs of information processing. Um, and that's a very important uh, other area that I wanted to touch on about the uh, real-time data integration and interpretation on the ships. This is um, the satellite bandwidth is and will uh, remains uh, for the next few years uh, a bottleneck, and that actually forces us to try and uh, incorporate the capability for data uh, analysis, annotation, interpretation locally. So it pushes it not just to the vehicles, but it pushes it on the ships so vehicles can communicate with the ships and they can uh, analyze the data and they can provide scientists who are on board of the ship with real time, so to say, tactical information to not have them to wait on shore for another season until they process the data and the phenomenon has completed, but they can do it now in real time. They can plan for the next day research with the outputs of your supercomputer model on board, on board of the ship that was running overnight with your yesterday's data. So that becomes, that becomes possible. Um, uh, we're also seeing uh, uh, big changes. Um, we believe that the large changes will be driven by the areas of industry that are advancing with the highest pace these days. And those are uh, software technologies. Those are the computer science, artificial intelligence, uh, we're, we're observing that the rate of data acquisition, has been, this has been mentioned on several occasions, the rate of data acquisition these days outpaces so dramatically the rate of data interpretation and uh, extraction of information from the data. For example, we're collecting hundreds of hours of ROV video. It's in our particular exploration and research example. We're collecting hundreds of thousands of seafloor images. And uh, only a tiny fraction of that material is being properly, fully, completely annotated, documented, and information being extracted statistically just because of the workload it takes to uh, uh, analyze and understand what that data is. How can we bridge? How can we, how can we ramp up the rate of data uh, understanding, interpretation, analysis to, to bring it a little closer to the rate of data acquisition? Well, there are several means. Uh, there's, of course, the crowdsourcing, right? You, need, you can expose that to the enthusiasts, to the community, the citizen scientists, so that they can have a look at that and they can help you. They can help you identify the features that are easiest to identify. You can provide them with the interfaces that will involve them, that will make them enthusiastic about what they're doing, enthusiastic about understanding the ocean. I think lots of research in the future will be in the interfaces. How can you, the best interface is the one that you don't notice. Right? You just go there and it's intuitive for you. So how can you make it as easy and simple for citizen scientists or enthusiasts to learn about the ocean just by going to a website and diving right into this information and understanding what it is without realizing that they are learning new things, without realizing they're contributing to science. This beautiful fusion of science, technology, education, communication, will be possible through advancements in software, visualization, communications, and interfaces. So uh, that's another area where I think we'll be talking a lot over the next 10 to 20 years, if not, if not longer. Um, the, the interfaces, uh, I'm also following up on this uh, mentioning of the conferences, right? It's also an interface. It's a matter of an interface. Just recently, we've had this planning, and uh, uh, Jyotika is laughing because uh, she was there. Uh, we've uh, had a recent planning uh, workshop for Schmidt-Ursen Institute where we've uh, uh, demoed this uh, virtual reality-based um, uh, meeting software where two scientists located in completely different parts of their building in that case, but they could have been different parts of the world, were meeting together in a three-dimensional virtual world, opening up this uh, 3D model of a coral and observing it from different sides as if they were in a real world, but it was in 3D and they could scale it up and down and it was completely interactive. It didn't require 
all of those two people in that case, but for a conference that'd be a thousand people flying from around the world and uh, contributing to our CO2 situation. So, um, <coughs> yeah. Uh, now, but that only solves it partially. We've just recently had the project where we exposed about 10,000 images to the community in Australia. They've been able to tag it. But we've collected hundreds of thousands of images. So how can you scale it further up? Um, another area which will come to help is machine learning. And have you noticed in the recent years uh, how when you're listening to the directions from your GPS that you cannot distinguish that this is really computer speaking? There has been a qualitative step in advancement in machine learning in the last couple of years with just scary investment of, uh, into hardware and into the compute power that is dedicated to that by some organizations. Uh, the capability of machine learning is, is dramatically improving and uh, the ability to recognize the patterns, the visual patterns, uh, can be dramatically improved if we involve that uh, area of science uh, to support us. So with the, with the crowdsourcing, with support from uh, scientific communities or to make sure we have good training data sets, we can then propagate this further using machine learning, et cetera. And this will be applicable to other types of streaming data that currently are not amenable to analysis. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I guess another, uh, another uh, group, uh, we've named the students and uh, young researchers, I'd, I'd call hackers. Mm. They'll be part of this audience in the next step. Whether we want it or not, yes. Whether we want it. Yeah. Yeah. Good, thank you. So, so great insight. Let me ask you a slightly different question if I can. It's about the, the sponsorship paradigm. And so some of us in the room remember back when it was really all about the federal agencies and only the federal agencies, or government agencies, I should say, depending on, on where you lived in the world. And the paradigm changed. Here in the United States, we saw David Packard come in and start up in Bari, the Johnson family, uh, with uh, Harbor Branch. We've seen different approaches, certainly what XPRIZE has done with Schmidt uh, Foundation, uh, Schmidt Ocean Institute. Uh, we heard another example through uh, crowdsourcing, through Kickstarter. How do you think the funding paradigm will change and how will that reflect? The, the real question, I'm, I'm kind of bouncing around it, but is this a, just a blip on the screen? The investments by folks like the Schmitz in these kinds of very important science and technology issues, or is there a fundamental change that we're going to see reflected in Oceans 25, Oceans 35? Well, um, we are kept on the edges of our seats every year. Uh, we need to prove our worth to our founders uh, with reports and with deliverables and with articles and with data. And uh, um, so by, by being so bold to say that this is a, a, a long-term investment forever, um, uh, I, I know that we're being evaluated, not performance. We don't have and the question is, will we see more of that, do you think? Well, I would, I would certainly love for, for more such organizations to appear. Um, I also know that uh, together with our organization uh, in 2009, several others have been founded that didn't make it that long. Right. So, uh, and, and then, so if I can then, especially with the societies represented by their presidents here, how does that dynamic play out? Right, right now, my sense is there's not by, a, by design a strategy of working with the private sector contributions there has evolved a strategy of working with uh, funding, public funding agencies. How do you see that changing? Hmm. That's, a, that's a wonderful question and also the one that, is, uh, uh, that might be difficult to answer. Um, well, and also, I'd also ask Ray and Renee the same question. That's right. Well, <laughs> our planning horizon is next couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have the large asset that will continue to be operated for a certain period of time. Um, how can we work with other agencies? We uh, try to encourage all of our collaborators to um, uh, bring in participants from other agencies and institutions. Yeah. yeah. But as far as longer term strategy. Um, and, and this is a wide open question if anybody on the panel wants to dive in with that. In, incidentally, does this mic work? Because with one mic there, we're kind of constraining the ability of the panelists to speak. So can we add this mic to the, the mix? Anyone? Uh, and there's a public mic, so it, it, if not, please just raise your hand and we'll pass the mic over to you. How will the injection of private, significant private resources uh, into the marine, or the ocean technology and ocean research community affect oceans, in 20, oceans 25, oceans 35, if at all? One of the goals that we have, and that's just to continue on this idea. Speaking to the mic, please. Okay. 
One of the goals uh, for our organization is to identify technical innovation and to prove their uh, efficacy in a context of important scientific projects. That's what we're doing, and we will continue to do that. And uh, the key impact that we create as we see it is when the innovations and workflows, practices, methodologies that we uh, demonstrate are then being utilized by others. Mm -hmm. uh, examples are, for example, very low cost uh, live video streaming to YouTube that we've supported. The examples are deployment of high performance computing on the research ship that we've supported. Uh, hopefully there will be other um, uh, different uh, systems and capabilities that we uh, support and uh, okay. deploy on our ship. Thank you. Um, uh, go ahead, Ray. I'm going to see if this works, too. We'll leave that one back there if folks want to. The thought that occurred to me as I was listening to you all, thank you very much. I took a bunch of notes from each of you. Um, you know, each of these OCEANS conferences has an exhibit floor, and it has these technical tracks. It has tutorials on Mondays, and it has workshops on Mondays, and that leads to these technical tracks and exhibits. We do have private sector sponsorships, or patrons, we call them. I wonder if we move forward in 2025, because one of the things that I keep looking for is if the, if the federal government is, is going to be strapped more and more over the course of time, is my belief. I mean, you, you can only do so much with a tax dollar. If there were ways going forward where the federal government, the government system, if you will, meaning federal, state, local, and starts to look more at regional problems and challenges, like, like climate and resilience, so that sort of thing, if that idea of cooperation, coordination, integration drives that because of, that, of the dwindling abilities to make those, cap, those investments, and then how the private sector can start to use venture capital to move that idea of integration and blue economy forward because of everything you just said, Susan. I think there's so much untapped you know, potential, but we've still, in our society today, I see are still operating too much into the, what I would call stovepipes and into individual camps. And if a society like ours can be a, a foster that idea of more, so getting back to my first point was we have this exhibit floor and we have these technical tracks. It's still, I, I think, we still haven't gotten ourselves, you know, a way of getting that together, exactly. People come here to buy and sell, they go to the exhibit floor. That's the, the machine that drives the financing of these conferences. And then people register and they talk about their ideas. But my sense is there's still too much of a schism between the two camps, even though they're part of the conference. But maybe we, we look for, what cha we challenge ourselves to wait, work for ways to, to bring those things together. So Paul, that mic works there now, that level of your mic. Thanks. Uh, I mean, building on that, one of, the, uh, one of the, the strong trends and interests that we've seen and, and are working to harness is the role of the investment community in the future of the ocean. Both the science and the technology and, and sustainability issues, but in a general sense, you could uh, characterize that as sort of long-term economic opportunities uh, that uh, are also uh, creating, um, for which there are investment possibilities. But what we've seen, and I've, I've had, um, as we work uh, in, in our efforts in the World Ocean Council, very much to create this sense of a multi-sectoral ocean business community that's all across the sectors and the vast ecosystem of, of companies and subsectors that make each of those possible, and, and uh, including insurance and finance and, and others. Uh, that there are these different initiatives, uh, funding, investment, innovation initiatives regarding uh, ocean and ocean investment opportunities, but many of them are um, somewhat isolated and not of the scale uh, necessary to really grapple with uh, the, uh, the issues and the opportunities. <coughs> and so we've started to put some of these uh, Connect these, connect these different uh, investment interests uh, together. And in fact, at the Sustainable Ocean Summit in a few weeks, we're exploring uh, getting a, a more proper sort of network of ocean investment um, initiatives working together to connect them with the science, the technology, and the actual ocean users to really uh, build that sort of uh, uh, network of uh, linkages between those that have the potential to, to create solutions and, and be cost effective with those in the business community who need those solutions and link to the science, 
and government uh, 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 experts that have the information on what, what is possible and what could be possible in the years to come. So I think there's, we're going to see more of that in the future, and, and events like this should have the investment community here to help then connect directly with, with the technology and science uh, providers and thinkers so that we, uh, we don't, uh, building on what Ray said, that we don't uh, hope that will happen, but we design for that to happen. <coughs> Thank you. Susan, go ahead. But then I want to open it up to the audience. We've been going about an hour, and hopefully we've provoked some thoughts, some questions. So be thinking about it, and we're going to want to be able to capture your question with the mic. So you can either stand up to the mic there, or we'll find a way to get it to you. Well, I'd just go like ahead. to follow up with Paul, Please. because I think one of the, one of the issues, as you, as you clearly note, is, is, is getting some of these technologies out of out of the research institutions and universities and into, into the private sector so that, that, that they can go for it. And that, and that, that, that technology pipeline um, can only be enhanced and go further down that technology pipeline if the necessary test facilities are, are developed. And, and that's one thing that we've done, we've been able to do with a, with a wonderful grant from the um, uh, state of Massachusetts uh, to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is to build some of these new test facilities um, that um, allows that technology um, uh, pipeline to be enhanced and that is available not just to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution but the surrounding ecosystem industries that are, that are needing to do that. That sort of thing as well. Very good, thank you. Renee slipped me 20 bucks at the start, so he's going to get a chance to speak now. <laughs> yeah. And then Kent. Okay, 20 euros. And, and be is aggressive out there with questions. Okay. Okay, 20 euros Go. is a bit more. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, yeah, the, what I hear is that also that's a model, uh, that's a, a model which is, uh, I'm afraid to say, US centric. It's not the same model we have uh, in Europe, and uh, this integration between uh, private and public is, uh, is a driving force be behind the very large governmental, in a sense, program of Europe. It's not a government, but uh, the a Horizon 2020, so it's not 2025, it's 2020, but when we write a project, and I've written several, one of the driving forces is that what we call a, the technology transfer. Uh, we, uh, we must, as institute or universities, uh, my institute is not in the university system, but uh, we, uh, we are working together with the uh, R&D uh, uh, people in the industry, and uh, we build projects together, and uh, we are forced, because uh, the main driver for everyone in the world is, is money. And uh, so we, no, we need money to, to develop a project. The money is given if there is a techno technological transfer in the end. So that's the open model. And uh, of course, we are protected. Uh, we have IP, I mean, uh, intellectual properties, yes, IP. We have non-disclosure agreements. We have things like that that we write in our contracts. But altogether, when we form this consortium, uh, the uh, Something that we have been, uh, let's say, we, we, I, don't, I won't say we were born with, because I'm a bit uh, older than that, but something that I've been talking in this language for forever is TRL, uh, uh, the, the technical readiness level. And uh, when we write a project, okay, what is a TRL? That, and the TRL, if it is not a, um, something that uh, will be used maybe three years later in the industry, uh, it's not the same kind of project. We have also upstream projects, but then in an upstream project, we don't have so many companies because they, are, they, they look at what uh, is upstream and they say, okay, it might be good or not. And so for an Oceans Conference, uh, I think that the, uh, the exhibitors, mainly it's not a trade show, they're not here to make a lot of money selling things, I think that what model we could use is that the exhibitors be part, or be, they are invited in a conference, they, they can attend, of course, sessions, and the sessions are because it's, uh, let's say, uh, uh, upstream research. There are things that are promising, things that can be developed, and that's their role to, to, to talk to the uh, public or, in, or universities or institutes in order to see, okay, could we work together and. Uh, and, uh, and uh, that's like that, I've uh, had some projects in the corridors, as I said. Thank you, Renee. And I should point out, I, I apologize, I actually had Horizon 2020 on my list of funding mechanisms here, and I appreciate you bringing the international perspective to that. Uh, Kent, did you have a comment you wanted to make? Yes, let's, let's pass the lovelier mic down there, please. And then, um, 
if we can free up, if somebody can help me and free up that mic, there was a question over here somewhere. Somebody raise their hand. Okay, a couple of questions. Okay, well, let's hold on. Let's uh, give Kent the mic, and then we'll pass it over. Well, Rick, I first of all wanted to respond to your question about how we, how we can make some of these public-private partnerships happen and, and happen more, more often. Um, I, think, I think it's really going to be driven by necessity. Uh, for, for our industry, um, we have relied historically on the federal government to perform a lot of the science acquisition that, that we're needed to get our license to operate. But with budget cuts in the federal budgets, uh, it's going to be, they're, they're, able, they're not able to do as much. And at the same time, stakeholder expectations are rising. Uh, you know, Shell had some, had some uh, difficult experiences in the Arctic and offshore of Alaska. And what we learned there was we had, we had to get out there and perform a lot of that science ourselves because the federal government just was not capable or able to, to get it all done. So it's going to be driven by necessity, um, but I also wanted to, to respond to the, the issue someone said of, of getting technology from the lab to the field. And I want to use the example of the SERPENT program that's in operation in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, whereby uh, researchers use um, essentially downtime of our ROVs when they're not doing things offshore uh, to film the bottom and, and the creatures down below. So uh, if there were some technology that needed to be deployed uh, in the deep ocean, uh, there may be an opportunity to utilize some of the ROVs that we have offshore to do that. Good. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the phones. <laughs> okay. And I'd ask uh, commenters or questioners, obviously, to identify yourselves. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I'm Jay Perlman. I'm with IEEE. And uh, I want to first thank everybody who organized this panel. The breadth and the comments are, are wonderful. Uh, I do have a question, and it relates to something Susan said about bringing the service industry, and Paul, you had mentioned a little more of the breath. Uh, when I go to this meeting, I don't see a lot of scientists here. And then when I go to the AGU Ocean Sciences, I don't see many engineers, but I see a lot of wonderful scientists. In the 2025, 20, 2035, 20, how do we bring those communities together to work effectively and to really do the ocean information that we need? Thank you. So let's give the panel a chance to comment, and if you'll pass the mic to the row behind you. Yes, thank you. And then after that, Jodica, you'll be up. Please, panelists. Victor, go ahead. One way we do that at Schmidt Ocean Institute is uh, by structuring the proposal uh, review process in such a way that it requires uh, scientists to work uh, with advanced technologies and we evaluate them both on the merit of the science and uh, how much it contributes to the state of the art of technology, what they're going to demonstrate as part of the project. So that naturally requires them to do that, while also sharing the data, so you also get evaluated in that before we take them to, to see. Susan, did you want to come in? Um, well, there obviously has to have uh, a need, uh, you know, a, a perceived um, advantage, if you will, for those other communities to, to join you. Um, and again, you can look at different models. Um, I'm, I'm both a member of AGU, I'm a member of AMS. I love AMS because it has the three sectors there, as memberships of the society. It has the academic and research community, it has the governmental operations services community, and it has the for-profit um, sectors. And that's what really gives that conference a very unique flavor. I go to AGU, mainly for the cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary breadth that I don't have at AMS. Mm -hmm. And so, so there's, 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 so what, so, so we gotta find the niche for bringing MTS, IEEE, OES, and um, AGU, or Ocean Sciences, along with the private sector to a meeting. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Next question. Oh, sorry, sorry Renee, go just ahead. adding a comment, and because that's an Ocean's conference, that's, we, if we don't offer the opportunity for an ocean science person to come, this ocean science person will not come. It's, a, it's a kind, kind of ob obvious. So I was talking about creating or developing new topics to be added to conference. Okay, if we create a topic that is uh, uh, appealing for, for ocean science people, then they will come. That's uh, but, uh, up to us. But if we don't do it, we don't have it. Next question. John Flory, I've been a member of MTS for many years, but also very much involved in the JOAB and RECON, and also involved in meeting again today to write the procedures manual. Uh, 
My forte here and my concern, I guess, is the technical sessions and publications. I see the face-to-face -face sessions are still going to be very important. But I think they're going to also evolve into a teleconference, which anybody in the world can tune into and participate in even, uh, if appropriately registered and give us some money for it. Uh, our publications especially are going to revolve uh, no longer being a digital copy of a, quote, paper, unquote. But they're going to also be cross-referenced within the cells. They're going to have embedded in it video and sound. And even after the presentation of the conference, is going to have the presentation and the discussion integrated with it. Uh, I, all, I was going back to, I had to plead with you people to say, we don't need two columns of paper. Because this is going to read on a computer. We just need one column. Finally, we now have one column of technical papers. OK. Um, the, uh, also, then we're not going to have a page limit on this thing, at least not a 12-page page limit. We're going to have a, a gigabyte or maybe bandwidth limit on the pages, or papers, but we're going to really look at these things from the standpoint that they are electronic and not paper. Uh, and uh, I see how we're going to uh, teleport or just teleconference the fun night. I don't know how we're going to do that. <laughs> um, but I think we're going to have to uh, uh, also, uh, going, well, we we'll have to I agree with, with what Bernay is saying, is what goes on in the hall is very important also, meeting the people. One of the problems with the present thing is 18 minutes for a technical presentation discussion does not really allow any discussion. That's why it's held in the hall. We need to find some way to expand the limit for active discussion of the papers, even online and even forever, okay? I think also one of the problems here is we're going to have to look at the a problem here of the transportation involved in getting to this conference, and that's why we're going to have to go out to our homes and do this by Skype, whatever else it may be, because traveling, we're never going to be able to perfect the electric airplane. We're always going to have to use our beloved hydrocarbons to fuel the airplanes to get us here. And John, do you have a question? What? Do you have a question I you want to ask? Okay. Well, what do you think about this? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, I'm going to actually suggest, uh, Eric, do you want to take a shot at that? You were the one who first brought up the issue of, uh, if you will, electrifying the conference. Sure. I, I mean, I was, it was partially in jest to say that we'd all teleconference, and I, I absolutely agree that uh, the kind of face-to-face -face meetings, there's, there's something that's very hard to replicate with technology. Um, that being said, I mean, we, we think about this a lot at OpenROV, not for conferences per se, but for bringing people together on a topic that could be live. Um, I mean, one of the main things we're working on right now is internet control with our vehicles. Um, you know, look at the amount of time that especially young people spend playing video games, you know, and they're flipping bits. That's all they're doing. If you can flip rocks, that's much better. So what if a conference isn't just talking about it and then separately be between that year and the next year people do it? What if those were merged together? What if it's not a conference where you're talking about what you did or what you will do, it's you're doing it, and as it's happening, people are involved. I think that's, that's really what the power of teleconferencing, as we're calling it today, but it's more high tech than that, you know, has. Um, if, if we can all be together as it's happening, and as we are looking at some, you know, pelagic species deciding, you know, what should we do about it from a scientific standpoint, or how should we interpret it, or as there's a technical issue that we're worrying about, you know, discuss how this could be done better, that, it's not a blending of, of um, people. It's more a blending of circumstance. It's, it's that we're all, we're all involved with it as it's happening. We're making it better as it's happening. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I use a telepresence robot. That's at our lab all the time. The technology is getting there. Anything's possible. Um, we just don't know exactly what it'll look like. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Jodica? Uh, excellent panel. Um, Please identify uh, yourself. Jodica Vimani from XPRIZE. Um, regarding the teleconference, I think augmented reality is where we're going, which is what we saw, Victor, a few weeks ago. Um, have any of you thought about, in the next five to ten years, we'll have another five billion people online. We will have, Pico, as, as Rick has mentioned, Pico satellites, more satellites. If we solve the bandwidth problem, how will that change any of, I mean, any of your thoughts with all these people from other continents coming online and using um, the same technologies and having the same access that everyone else does. Okay, next question. <laughs> <laughs> Panelists. Can I, can I go back? Oh, go ahead, Eric. It's just it's a kind of related to the first thing we were talking about um, and what you were just saying. Um, it would be very silly if 
you know, it were like 1965 and we're at a computer conference to be talking about what the future of computer funding is going to be like, you know? It's, it's driven completely by where the market is. And as this technology becomes more ubiquitous, as everyday people have access to ROVs, have access to um, really powerful data analysis, um, the demand completely switches. It all gets completely screwed up um, in a good way. So I, I think that, I think that you know, right now we're talking about what's useful for oil and gas, what's useful for academic research. That's going to be blown away. It's going to be... It's going to be like the change we saw in computers, where all of a sudden the ocean becomes accessible to everyone. And um, maybe we're going to see entertainment come out of this. Maybe we're going to see you know, all these other things. Um, so I, I think that's kind of partially answering your question, but I, that's the right way to think about it, is what happens when all of these other people, when the masses get access to this thing that only this kind of tight-knit community has right now? That's, that's a great question. Quickly, the uh, submarine cable industry will be very happy to have all those people coming online. <laughs> <laughs> Renee, did you have a comment? Or a, Victor, a quick, go yeah, ahead. A quick comment. I guess it's, um, uh, as, as in most other situations where you provide more resource to a problem, it starts being uh, sold sooner. More. So more things will happen at a more rapid pace, uh, and the progress will probably be observed. It's, it will be more difficult to predict how exactly changes will be occurring or affect them. But uh, you, I would expect more, both greater depth and greater breadth of uh, activities. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, what I wanted to say, of course, bandwidth is a, is a problem. And uh, bandwidth is also increasing bandwidth is a solution that is, uh, is already existing. I mean, uh, in, again, I'm from the telecom uh, world, and uh, we are uh, testing the 6G, uh, actually. So it exists. It works. Uh, Okay, but uh, five million people, uh, five billion, or whatever the number is, uh, are they interested in what we say? Uh, that's one, one question. I mean, uh, I agree that uh, I would be pleased that five million people would listen to me. I know that uh, that, <laughs> that is possible. It's uh, in the United States. It's called NSA. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, Too late. <laughs> okay, no, but uh, basically the, the question you had and po possibly uh, John Floy as well is that uh, one, one uh, parameter is that we are humankind, we are human, we are men, women, and uh, we are person of habits. And uh, so it takes time to go from uh, whatever 12 pages you were talking about to something which is, uh, you know, uh, fit to a digital something, and uh, we don't know uh, what is the perception of the individual. When uh, we have, nowadays, we have newspaper digital. Are they so different from a newspaper paper? Okay, they are not so different. They have the same look, except it's on my, my uh, uh, iPhone 12, no, 6. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, that's, uh, the, the, the future is that, okay, we will have all these uh, marvelous things uh, because that's the evolution of the uh, digital and connectivity of the world, but do we want to have conferences where we uh, have uh, the dilution of the uh, science and the purpose because the, you have much more people uh, not understanding what is said and people understanding each other. That's one of the concerns I have. I mean. We are kind of a, a, a tiny part of the uh, population talking together. The rest of the population don't really understand what we say, scientifically speaking, I think. So that's uh, an, something in equation that you have to take into account. It's not, uh, the answer is, uh, I don't have the answer actually. The, the answer is difficult. <coughs> You have to think about it. Okay, we, we had uh, some more questions here. I have no idea where the mic is. Drew's got the mic. Drew. I do have a question for Kent, but before Drew, I Drew, can you that, identify yourself for those who may not I'm know sorry, you I'm sorry. I'm Drew Michel. I'm a past president of MTS, and, and I have to start also by saying I've been operating ROVs in the ocean since 1975, I guess. Uh, I've got to tell a quick story. Sorry, Rick. But <laughs> A few years ago, a couple of young men called an old guy who had seen all the failures over the years, umbilicals, thrusters, connectors, cables, and they asked him his advice for starting this new ROV thing. And he spent an hour and a half telling about all the problems they were going to have and why they shouldn't quit their day jobs and do this. 
Well, I'm glad you didn't <laughs> listen to her. <laughs> Very good. Yes. <laughs> Kent, uh, I'm familiar with the SERPA program and, and the uh, doing it on the shell rigs. How many other oil companies, how many other vessels are involved in that? To, to my knowledge, uh, we are the only company that's doing it right now, but I uh, understand that BP is going to begin doing it, and we're, we're trying to socialize that right now and, and get, it, you know, get as many of the rigs offshore as possible to be doing it. And um, it's part of a proposal for a science collaboration that we're putting forward right now. We've already met with the National Academy of Sciences and with uh, BOEM, and uh, they're both enthusiastic about it, so um, we hope that it's going to move forward. Great. Good. Okay, let's go for more. This is really wild. i got to tell you a quick story. We're going to go back here. Drew, don't leave the room. Thank you. We need the mic. Okay. It, really interesting. A few years ago, I was taking a, a government training course out in Colorado Springs at the Air Force Academy, and we were all came into a room. We randomly selected, took our own seats. And then a guy we later find out was a PSYOP, a psychological operations guy from the Air Force, asked a whole bunch of seemingly innocuous questions. What's your favorite color? What's your favorite baseball team? And it turned out that people self-selected in a really weird way. The ones who were always going to ask questions sat on one side of the room, and the ones who weren't going to ask questions sat on the other side of the room. So we got a lot of questions over on this side. Let's go through them, please. And, and please okay. introduce yourself. From the, from the question side, Mel Heron, uh, OES. Adcom, and uh, I've been around there for a while and uh, messing about with HF surface radars. In this meeting, right starting from the plenaries, we heard that um, there's, we expect a shift from sensors, emphasis on sensors, maybe to emphasis on delivering services at the end. I, I empathise with the comment, and I forget who made it, that we have a deluge of, uh, of data. That was Rene, but, but going on from there, that the collection of data is exceeding the absorption and the processing of the data. And that's, I, that's my experience, we are doing that. So in 2025, I think we'll have um, intelligent machines uh, helping us to process data. Um, all that will happen. Now if I can just pause a minute and say that uh, m my car in 1965 was quite different from what it is now in that in as much as it does more things for me. In 1965, I had to do a lot of the work, but now all sorts of things happen. Uh, the windscreen wipers come on and I don't even have to think about it. And then, you know, and the lights and stuff. So, so in the same way, I think the processing of this deluge of data, w we will work on that and we will accomplish so when we come to do science and engineering and deliver services, we'll be starting from a different level. We'll have more of that stuff will be available. So I imagine that in 2025, we'll come here and people will talk about how they're starting from that base, whatever it is, and delivering services and solving problems. It's the, it's the interpretation from the data to the particular problem, or, and it's that understanding, so from data, the understanding is, is the step we will still be working on, I'm sure. So that's what I think um, we'll be doing in, in 2025. And my question is, what do you all think about that? So what I'd like to do, <laughs> Ken, Ken, I'd like to ask you, you haven't had a chance to, to really respond. And, and there's one argument that says that that will not be necessarily the case. The standard modus operandi within defense, within naval forces, is, is really going to remain unchanged. And so I'd like to ask you to respond to that and then ask for others on the panel to respond. Sure. I, <clears throat> I tend to agree to some extent. I know over the last even five years or so since we've been using glider technology, we've collected over 200,000 profiles, which is orders of magnitude of what we've done uh, with shipboard data even over the last decade. And what we're able to do is use, you know, intelligent machines, use the supercomputing power to make sure that data gets assimilated and create ocean forecasts. So the next step along with the prediction will be to take that knowledge and turn it into decision making for the commanders, for the people out in the field. And so I, th I think you're right in that sense. But also, computing power will continue to evolve and we'll be able, I think, in, at least in the short term, keep up with the, the big data component of that. Where that leads 15, 20 years from now uh, still remains to be seen. Great, thank you. Others on the panel want to respond? 
Paul? Yeah, I'd just like to, <clears throat> in all of this discussion about technology and, and the ocean economy and the long-term future, just wanted to sort of draw a, a serious sort of human note to this, that all of this needs to be for a purpose. And one of those key purposes is to save lives at sea. And so all of us in society, we depend on whether we agree or not, we still depend on the energy, renewable and non-renewable, the, the maritime transport, um, uh, the telecommunications, et cetera. And there are men and women out there right now working hard and losing their lives at times. So part of this has to be fit for purpose work that delivers safe, environmentally sound uh, development. And just to, to keep that sort of human deliverable in mind as we, as we think about what, what we want to achieve and, and why. Thank you. Okay. Right here, you've had your hand up for, oh, the mic's over there. Okay. Hey, so on the Sorry. second row, you're next. Yeah, you've sir. had your hand up for a while. I guess the guy with the mic. Uh, That's right. right. Okay. Go for it. Hi, uh, I'm David Jones. I'm from the Applied Business Lab, University of Washington. And it kind of made me picking up what Ken was saying, but a, a theme that's been running through a lot of what you've talked about is cumulative factors issues, things, you know, social sciences. So perhaps a thought is in the future, you should have a track on social sciences. Maybe I'm thinking like decision makers, human factors. I know in AMS, they've been thinking about probabilistic forecasting, how do people take probabilistic forecasting, that could be a new area that you could invite people who are doing that kind of work but maybe aren't, wouldn't be even thinking about this kind of conference. Okay, great. Thank you. Response? Reactions from the panel? Yep, a lot of north-south head movement. Okay, good. So we'll go here and then Pete in the back. Go ahead. Okay, so this is more of a comment. So I'm Raina Jenkins from Ocean Networks Canada. And there's been some comments about um, we need to better convene some of these other sectors, like maybe the scientists having come here or other industry areas. Um, and I also think that big data is also a big growing part of this, and that, that's actually the opportunity where we can get more of these industries together. I'm really fortunate at Ocean Networks Canada that I get to work very closely with both scientists, the manufacturers, the engineers, the software developers, and just having all those people in one house does really help to spark all these great new ideas. And so if you had more of those people here together, that would spark more ideas in the corridors. Like I don't really see that many software developers here. There's a lot of engineers, not many software developers, not many scientists, not many data savvy people. So it would be better if we had used that big data as an opportunity to get all those people together. Do the, uh, either of the society presidents want to respond? Well, that, what you said is exactly what I think. So, uh, and that's something that we, uh, of course, have to take into account. I, I really, uh, um, the emphasis on what we, what do we do with data is uh, is a driving force because uh, in my own lab, I have a, uh, I'm creating a a group working on the, how to extract information from uh, from from the data. Because when I talk to the scientists, ocean science at IFREMER, which is equivalent of Wood uh basically what I say is they, it's, uh, they use about 2% of the data they have. They keep everything because we never know. So what we are proposing is to go back into the past of the data and, uh, and process the data in a way that they are comparable to what we have now because that's also a challenge. So, so Basically, my aim is to put together all these people f from different fields, and that's what you said, and uh, including the uh, social societal science people, because in my, in my institute there is a lab on social science. So, and that's a way to do it. Uh, and uh, interdisciplinarity, uh, that's uh, what uh, Ray was uh, talking, speaking about, or this I, interdisciplinarity is really one of the drivers, and that's also I don't want to always put Europe in front, but the Horizon 2020, one uh, of the main world among the four or five worlds that we heard is interdisciplinarity. You need to put together people from different fields in order to better understand the problem. So, yes. Thank you, Renee. Uh, Victor, quick response? That's right. It's just a, an opportunity for a consolidating remark because it comes again from the 5 billion users coming online and uh, also the comments about the need for purpose to understand what's coming from the data. Uh, also brings me back to the idea that um, the also growing blue economy, uh, we can only identify new applications, new uh, industries in the ocean if, if we have the bandwidth to explore and look at data from different perspectives. So uh, keeping the data in raw format does make sense because you can get new uh, insights from that.
but how exactly to analyze that, those methods will come over time. So we need to allow okay. for that to happen. Thank you. Susan, did you have a quick comment? Yeah, I just, I just would like to say in the, this whole discussion here, there are um, uh, actually waves right now that are happening where particularly by a, lot of, a lot of data that is in the ocean sciences is imaging data. Very, 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 very um, extensive um, data. Um, and, you know, uh, it's, it's putting together the right team of, a, of the domain scientists, in the case of a, a biological oceanographer, not with necessarily a computer scientist, uh, but uh, 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 an information scientist. Because information scientists really understand the role of delivering information, and not, which is not necessarily what a computer scientist um, would do. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Pete, yours, go ahead. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, I just had a, a burning thought. Sorry, Pete. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the whole idea of these societies and these, these conferences, where, as I've mentioned before, we are, I think of it as a convening source. This is how you draw in talent, this is how you draw in people. And people bring ideas and people bring the technology. So, I, I had an idea that as these conferences evolve with time, imagine a, a shark tank-like mentality here. If these yeah, because what the model of MTS is what have been these tech surges. The tech surges were, was kind of like what you were saying about the different camps that you, you work in under, under one ceiling. So imagine these a series of these uh, tech surges that are populated by, you know, what we would call Pete a decision maker, you know, the captain of a ship over here and a lab guy over there. I mean, I, I, it just seems to me like the, the cool piece of what we as a society bring to the table is to bring those camps together. Thank you, Ray. So, uh, Pete, this will be the last question, and I will give the... the lady. Pardon me? There is also a lady. We don't have so many women in the field. So. Well, I'm, I'm going to get to that. Um, but I want to I give the uh, panelists a chance for a last, the last word, too. And uh, it's a big panel, so short last words are going to take some time. So uh, yeah, OK. So if we had two questions and I missed one, then Pete, yours is not the last one. But if you could keep it short, I would appreciate that. I will indeed keep it short, Rick. Thanks. Thank I'm Pete Furs. I'm with Teledyne Marine, uh, retired Navy captain, oceanography. Um, recently, I attended the Go Ship Argo IOCCP meeting in Galway. And there were three diverse communities that did not routinely work together, although they were aware of each other and shared information. Um, I'm going to follow on the last three comments from the uh, field, ask each of the panelists to answer in 10 words or less. Who will you invite to Oceans 2025 organizationally, not as an individual? Earlier we heard that Rick was invited to be one of the co-chairs and, and plenary speakers. Who are you going to invite organizationally? And I ask the presidents to then write letters to those organizations and not ask them to come in 25, but come in 16. So Pete, if I can, that, that's a great question because I'm going to ask the panelists to each give a 30 second summary. Why don't we have them start with their answer to your question and then add to that, okay? 10 words or less was what I asked for, Rick. right? I'm, I'm keeping with you, Good. buddy. And, and there was a question. Renee's got oh, somebody specifically. I was going to facilitate with the microphone. Oh, okay. <laughs> ah. Thank you, Paula. We're on. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. I am, so, I am okay, the So here's what we're going to do. First of all, I'm, I'm exerting uh, moderators prerogative while we get the mic up there. And I want to share a couple of perspectives as we wrap up here. And, and the first thing I'll say is this was, to some extent, this was intended to be a little bit of pre-planning, thinking about how Oceans 2025 goes. My, my experience uh, working for the US Navy taught me that there's a fundamental rule, and that is you always need a battle plan. And then the other part of that rule is all battle plans are irrelevant on first contact. <laughs> so. This is a great exercise to think about these issues and get them on the table. What I heard here throughout was a theme of, it doesn't start with I, it was a diversification, and I mean that in a number of ways, uh, that what we're going to see is uh, diversification of technology that comes before the organization. If you think 20 years ago, and my thoughts really are, 
if you look at what happened 20 years back, can you project that out? So 20 years ago, we weren't thinking about mobile devices, cloud computing, uh, in situ genomics, that sort of thing. So technologically, what's going to happen in IT, in materials in the future, it's going to diversify. The science is going to diversify. We'll see new fields of study. We heard several examples here of the kinds of fields that we don't even really know what they are yet, but they will be part of the dialogue. Uh, the educational approaches will change. Certainly, if you look back 20 years ago, uh, we weren't thinking about a lot of the online educational experiences. We weren't thinking about things like blue MBAs, so there will probably be a whole new educational approach. Uh, I, I have to say this. The community will diversify. Um, I am reminded of uh, former Secretary of Navy Richard Danzig, who announced 20 years ago that if the United States Navy was not fully in gender parity by 2020, there would not be a United States Navy. And he wasn't expressing an opinion. He was simply stating that you've got to be reflective. Any organization has to be reflective of the populace it represents. Look around the room. Um, most of the faces look like mine. And, and that can't persist. There, that's a community issue. So I would like to think 20 years from now that aspect of diversification will take place too. Talked about diversification in sponsorship, investors. I heard investors and investment raised several times here. And what I really liked, we talked about diversification in the format. Augmented reality was the term Jodica used. I, I actually believe when I go back downtown to headquarters at NOAA, that's an augmented reality. But <laughs> I, I think the point is that this will take a very different form. We may not even recognize it. So in, in closing, my perspective is this is a wonderful discussion. Uh, I would argue this should be part of the oceans discussion every year uh, because we need to do some of this by design. Some of it will happen by default, but if it's not without this careful thought and consideration, uh, we won't get to where we want to get to. So with those perspectives, I really want to give the panel the last word. I'm going to uh, ask, yes, Pete, I, I'm not forgetting about your request. I want to go, uh, I'm going to suggest we actually do it uh, backwards from the way we started, uh, starting with Victor. And, and the challenge is, I, I'm going to take a little bit of liberty and say you don't have to limit it to 10 words, but you do have to identify who you'd want to invite but no more than 30 seconds in your closing thoughts overall, okay? Closing thoughts, who you'd want to have invited at Oceans 2025. Victor? And I might not have the names for the organizations. But Speaking of the mic, if you can, please. I might not have the names for all organizations, but I'd like to see, uh, indeed, the uh, uh, synthetic biology representatives. That would be really interesting. Uh, it'd be great to see representatives of space science, because uh, very often they deal with the same issues. In fact, there's lots of interactions between them and uh, ourselves. Um, uh, software. Software companies, big data companies, any, any flavors, uh, the, the bigger the better. Very good. Thank you. Susan? Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, actually, I would also add to the synthetic biology materials, uh, material scientists. Um, also thinking of, of big um, astronomical ast astronomy. Um, they're also dealing with big data. Um, and um, but also, I would, I, would, I would, is NSF here? National Science Foundation. Uh, National yeah. Science Foundation, the Ocean Division, the Atmospheric Division, the Earth Sciences Division, the Engineering Division, and the international programs. And the social behavioral and, and the economic. social behavior. Yes. Get, get them all here. Yeah, get, good. Get, get, them, get them all here. Um, I'd like to see some more sensor groups, um, uh, whether and particularly what is going on in the biology, chemistry, and physics to integrate those all together. Thank you. Renee? Okay, uh, innovation, we have to find new topics. Integration, we have to integrate uh, in the room. And, uh, and big data, we have to invite Google. Yeah, very good. Okay, right? I would invite other, other uh, conference uh, or uh, other societies. I like the idea of AGU. I like the idea of AMS. We've already kicked that thing around. Imagine if an oceans conference in 2025 was like an AMS umbrella conference. And it's been a, you, Andy, you've, you've tried it before, and it works. Very good. Paul? We'll be uh, <clears throat> inviting for the 10th year in a row a, a growing group of uh, ocean industry users and uh, hopefully a, a growing uh, network of ocean science and technology uh, investment uh, players. Great. Uh, Kent? Well, I would like to see more oil and gas company representatives uh, at, the, at the conference. And so I, I will uh, 
uh, commit to invite the American Petroleum Institute and, and through that, uh, their members. Uh, so just uh, in, in closing, I, I, would, I would just say or add that um, I think that uh, we in the oil and gas industry probably have more in common with the scientific community than not. Ken? So as we move forward in coupling ocean and atmospheric models, I think I'd like to invite our, uh, our sister command out in Monterey, California, Fleet and Americal, to have a representation here uh, at the next meeting. Also, there's been talk of public-private partnerships. I think uh, one thing that would be interesting would be to have an operational oceanography track for folks from Navy, NOAA, Shell, and other companies that are doing true operations can go and give some uh, talks on lessons learned and things like that. Very good. And the last 30 seconds, Eric. Uh, okay, so in Silicon Valley, we see all sorts of people who are totally into innovation. They love hacking on things. They just don't know what to hack on. Um, and so I would love to see a bunch of makers, people who are hungry to innovate, hearing what needs to be done. Bring in some hardware, software, hacker ninjas, and they will fix so many problems that we have. Very good. Thank you. So let's give a round of applause to the panelists. And, and I would like to take a minute to thank MTS and IEEE OES for sponsoring this, and I'd like to give a special thanks for Doug Wilson for your vision in pulling this panel together. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Everin. We are adjourned.